NASA Exploration Ground Systems joined the SLS Solid Rocket Boosters and Core Stage for Artemis II last weekend, and these recently completed milestones for the Orion spacecraft and the rocket point towards launch, but it's worth keeping in mind how much work remains to get there. Hey everyone, welcome back. The lifting of the SLS Core Stage and mating to the SLS Boosters is one of the more iconic milestones in the launch campaign, at least until we see the vehicle roll out to the pad. This week, I'll review the rest of that core stage to booster stacking process, many of the different views published so far, and go over a few news and notes about Gateway and the politics which is not far from mind. But I'll also try and keep things in perspective for Artemis II. The official Artemis II target date is still a year away, and even with the optimism that the launch teams can move the date up, this is still only the second time these programs have gone through a launch campaign. So, after reviewing a week with heavy emphasis on Artemis II news, a little reminder about what NASA's Artemis exploration programs still have to accomplish during these next crucial six months. The biggest Artemis II event of the past week occurred last weekend in the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center, where Exploration Ground Systems and prime contractor Amentum lifted the SLS core stage into VAB High Bay 3 and mated it to the solid rocket boosters. The big moves of the stage, the breakover to rotate it from horizontal to vertical in the transfer aisle, and then to lift it up towards the roof and then into the high bay 3 integration cell, occurred one overnight third shift to the next. The breakover was overnight Friday, March 21st into Saturday, March 22nd, and NASA provided video taken from this rarely seen point of view from what looks to be where the operators for the 175-ton trailing crane work. The video is sped up and it shows the forward end of the stage first being mostly raised by the 325 ton crane. We can see the yellow rails for the 175 ton crane that run along the transfer aisle. In this view we are looking from the south to the north, not exactly but more or less. Gradually we see the 175 ton crane begin to move forward to help swing the aft end of the stage over as the forward crane continues to lift the top of the stage. The rules kind of reverse as the lifting of the top slows down and lowering of the bottom of the stage moves faster. This is the plus Z side of the stage, so we're left with the inner tank section right in our face, so to speak, with the white fairing over one of the liquid oxygen feed lines that runs from inside to outside the inner tank and then down the outside of the liquid hydrogen tank to the engine section. The red door on the left is one of the ground support doors that covers an access opening into the inner tank. We can see several circular areas on the liquid oxygen tank above, which are development flight instrumentation sensor islands. Eventually, the 325-ton crane has the whole suspended load of the stage, and after breakover, the 175-ton crane is disconnected from the engine section. The crews came back for another red-eye shift overnight Saturday into Sunday, March 23rd, when the stage was lifted and stacked. These are a couple of stills taken before or very early in the lift from different locations in the transfer aisle and then in high bay 3 while the stage was still suspended on the 325 ton crane over the transfer aisle floor. The stage is 212 feet long or a little bit less than 65 meters, so the top can still be seen inside the high bay 3 integration cell and from the mobile launcher umbilical tower. This view looks like it's up around the platform C level and then this one around the platform F level. The stage was rotated into the orientation for mating with the boosters and then lifted up fairly close to the hook height of the 325 ton crane. The core stage takes up most of the length of the opening into high bay 3 from the transfer aisle. The diaphragm is about 266 feet in length or about 81 meters. As it is lifted, it was also moved from over the transfer aisle into high bay 3. The crane then lowered the stage down in between the boosters. In preparation for lowering the core stage down in between the boosters, a separate strap for each booster is used to pull them out just a little bit, as was done for shuttle stacking. This is a shot from a 2008 SU-3 operation, as external tank to SRB lift to mate was called. 
The yellow straps can be partially seen in this picture just below the platform. Here's a little explanation from an interview that I did in late 2020 with Exploration Ground Systems as Artemis 1 stacking got underway. Uh, yes, yes, we are doing that. Um, we call it the booster puller. Um, the strap that they used to use uh, during shuttle has turned into um, a strap with um, a load cell and position indicator so we can understand how, you know, how hard we're pulling on those boosters. We want to give a little room for the, for the, the mate um, but we don't want to pull too hard and, um, you know, cause stress uh, to the vehicle. So we have uh, added a load cell to make sure of that. And uh, we have a position indicator as well to make sure that we are, we are in where we want those boosters to be to allow for that mate. We can see the straps that were used during this latest core stage to booster lift to mate operation in a couple of the images released during this past week. As the crane lowers the stage, it fine-tunes the position to line up the forward attach points between the booster forward skirts and the core stage inner tank. And also in this shot, we see one of the aft attached struts on one of the boosters with the stage being maneuvered to line up that attach point. NASA KSC Public Affairs said that Softmate occurred at 10.02 a.m. local Eastern Daylight Time on March 23rd with Hardmate a few hours later at 2.05 p.m. Eastern. In a couple of the final photos in the set released so far, we see platforms around the boosters and core stage have been extended, platform F and platform E above it. A further extendable platform has also been set up around the top of the core stage forward skirt to provide access to the upper or forward flange. That's where the lift spider is attached in these photos. Sometime after the weight of the stage was transferred from the crane to the boosters and the ML, those bolts would have been removed and the lift spider carried away by the crane back down to the transfer aisle floor. The Artemis II flight crew provided an updated view of the mated boosters and core stage at the end of the week. Commander Reed Weissman posted his weekly Artemis II update video on Instagram. He is at astro underscore read there. In this week's video, he was joined by Mission Specialist Jeremy Hansen. All right, I'm here at the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center in Florida with... Jeremy, and you're not going to believe what is just over there. I got to turn the camera around. It's been a great week. What are we looking at, Jeremy? We are looking at our ride to the moon. This is the SLS and the solids. The core stage was stacked between the two solids, and it's a beautiful sight. We were just over there walking around it and talking to the folks. It's just, I wish you could all come here and see it. It's amazing to see this and the people in person. They took this footage of the stack from a 16th floor vantage point on the high bay foreside of the VAB transfer aisle. In this footage, we can see that the 325-ton crane and lift spider are no longer in the integration cell, so that operation is complete. That same upper flange is where the lower flange of the launch vehicle stage adapter will be bolted when it is stacked. The NASA blog post on Monday, March 24th about the core stage lift to mate noted that the LVSA would be stacked quote-unquote in the coming weeks, so that likely means sometime into April. And that was the forecast that we heard from Exploration Ground Systems back in December. Public Affairs also provided a few shots of the LVSA taken on March 20th after it returned to VAB High Bay 4 after being temporarily parked in the transfer aisle for a couple of weeks earlier in the month. In between now and then, there's still plenty of work to do. All the lower high bay platforms will be extended back around the boosters and core stage, the access doors to the inner tank and engine section will be opened, and internal access platform kits will be reassembled inside those volumes. And big picture, to put things in some perspective, the overall integration of the core stage and boosters is only just beginning. Whether it's called stacking or mating them, that is just the physical bolting of the structures. Now, all the systems that need to work together will have to be integrated, and then all the functionality between the SLS flight computers at the top of the core stage, and all the systems and machinery distributed throughout the boosters and core stage will have to be verified. Those interfaces between the core and the boosters have to be connected, but then all the mobile launcher to SLS interfaces also have to be connected. Integrated test and checkout between the launch control center, mobile launcher, and SLS, the stages and boosters, will take a long time. 
testing of the ground umbilical interfaces and stage and booster interfaces is expected to run through the rest of the spring and summer. Stacking of SLS will continue in April with the lift and mate of the LVSA first and then the interim cryogenic propulsion stage or ICPS. The LVSA should be more or less ready to lift when the time comes, but the ICPS is in the multi-payload processing facility for loading of hydrazine into its attitude control system tanks. Via KSC Public Affairs, EGS Spacecraft Offline Operations has completed preparations for that hazardous operation in the MPPF. Servicing the tanks won't happen until next month, April, closer to when the stage is transported from the MPPF to the VAB for stacking. As noted, there are still preparations in the VAB, and the LVSA has to be stacked first. The hydrazine loading will also require the MPPF to be cleared of everyone except the personnel that will load the tanks. That suspends any other work in the facility, including preparations to receive Orion for its commodity loading later in the spring. PAO also updated the forecasted shipping date of the Orion stage adapter, which connects Orion and SLS, and will also hold a few CubeSats for Artemis II. The OSA is now expected to be flown from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville to KSC in late spring. Now that the core stage is vertical again in High Bay 3, there is also a couple of RS-25 engine servicing operations that need to be done in and around the engine section. The engine controller units will be reinstalled, but also engine 2063 in the number 4 position will be removed and replaced by engine 2061. Once access has been re-established to the engine section, preparations for those operations are among the things that could be started in the next few weeks before the LVSA is stacked. This will be the first vertical engine removal and install for SLS. It wasn't needed for Core Stage 1, either at Stennis Space Center for the Green Run campaign there, or during the Artemis 1 launch campaign in 2021 and 2022. Big picture, highly visible final assembly and vehicle integration milestones like this provide some clarity about progress and the current status of Artemis II preparations, but it's still too early to say whether launch can be moved up from April 2026. As I've reported from recent interviews with NASA officials, we know how they plan to make the goal of rolling out to the pad by the end of the year. They want to complete Orion stacking preparations in five months this time, and they are combining all the testing at the pad into a single pad flow with the launch countdown. As a part of that plan, SLS integrated test and checkout would also need to be completed by the end of the summer, so that both the rocket and spacecraft are ready for Orion to be mated. But now we have to see about execution of that plan. In addition to launch operations at Kennedy Space Center, Exploration Ground Systems is responsible for landing and recovery operations. Over the past several days, EGS is participating in Underway Recovery Test 12, another landing and recovery exercise with the U.S. military off the coast of San Diego. NASA posted some pictures at the end of the week of activities on and around the USS Somerset during the training exercise. A full-scale mock-up of the Orion crew module, the crew module test article, is again being used to train for the post-splashdown recovery of the crew and spacecraft. Artemis II is the first crewed Orion test flight, following two uncrewed missions to Earth orbit in 2014 and a multi-week lunar orbit mission in 2022. Following splashdown, a team of Navy divers will make sure the area around the capsule is safe and then set up a raft for the crew to egress the spacecraft. They will then be lifted one by one into a helicopter and taken back to the U.S. Navy amphibious ship for a medical evaluation. The recovery team will then begin recovering the Orion crew module, attaching towing lines and bringing it into the well deck of the amphibious ship. Other members of the open water recovery team will also attempt to recover the forward bay cover and parachutes before they sink. During the URT-12 exercises, the EGS landing and recovery team is practicing those procedures on the USS Somerset along with NASA and European Space Agency astronauts, including Artemis II pilot Victor Glover and Artemis II backup crew member Andre Douglas. In this shot from the hatchway of the CMTA, we see four of those astronauts inside. 
Going clockwise from the left, we see NASA astronauts Denise Burnham in the pilot seat, Andre Douglas behind the commander seat, and then Stan Love and ESA astronaut Luca Parmitano in the mission specialist seats. This was also noted in Commander Reed Weissman's video. Another interesting thing before playing that is, going back to the question of a work to date, note what he says at the end about the launch date. That was pretty fun. And then uh, Victor and Andre are at sea right now doing what we call URT-12, underway recovery training number 12, which is our last opportunity to get out with the United States Navy before we launch early next year. And uh, that In other news and notes for the week, on Thursday, March 27th, NASA posted a couple of pictures of the first advanced electric propulsion system flight thruster on social media. This unit and two more will eventually be installed in the Gateway's power and propulsion element by PPE prime contractor Maxar. The 12 kilowatt hall thrusters built by L3 Harris are one of two sets of solar electric propulsion thrusters that will be installed on PPE. In addition to the L3 Harris advanced electric propulsion system thrusters, four 6 kilowatt hall thrusters built by Busek form the other set. The flight thruster is at NASA's Glenn Research Center for vacuum testing. I also asked NASA Public Affairs during the week for an update on transportation of the Habitation and Logistics Outpost module, HALO for short, and PAO says it is expected in April. The primary structure was assembled and tested by Tala Selenia Space in Turin, Italy. It is being shipped from there to a facility of prime contractor Northrop Grumman's in the Phoenix area, where the structure will be outfitted with equipment and turned into a working spacecraft. There were also a few political calendar notes provided in articles during the week. Eric Berger wrote in a story for Ars Technica that the nomination hearing for Jared Isaacman is now expected in the May timeframe. And this story on federalbudgetiq.com says that the fiscal year 2026 president's budget request is expected to be delivered to Congress in mid-May. So maybe we hear more about what President Trump and Elon Musk have planned for Artemis before that time, but maybe not. The nomination hearing for Mr. Isaacman may be the first opportunity to get his views on changes that Trump and Musk have already made with NASA and future policy that would be set in the budget request. Whether stated explicitly or not, the funding that the president proposes for the different Artemis programs will say a lot. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative, and consider subscribing to find out what's going on with Artemis every week. If you're willing to make a one-time donation, I would really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me a Coffee page in the description of this video. Your donations will make it possible to make more field trips to NASA centers and contractor facilities here in the U.S., even when it's not the greatest time to find an airplane seat or a hotel room or a rental car like spring break in Florida or Mardi Gras in New Orleans, for example. I also recently added memberships to this YouTube channel, and I want to thank all the people who have joined so far. I am planning on posting additional videos there and more frequent updates on what's happening during the week. I included a separate link to join in the description, but you can also click on the join button on this page above the description, and there's also a place to join on the channel homepage. Thanks again for your support.